the best word to describe motherhood or a series of words is full on. The idea of having to do my job at the same time as looking after a newborn baby kind of bursts every kind of brain cell I've got. Hi, my name's Claire Newell and I'm the investigations editor at The Telegraph. This is my first ever podcast. Welcome to The Juggling Act. I really wanted to have a baby. I'm in my late 30s and I saw people around me at work and I thought, well, they've got children. They seem to be managing to work and have careers. If they can do it, I can do it. So we had our baby at the beginning of the year in January. Um, It was a really amazing experience despite all the sleep deprivation. Being a journalist... Things happen at the last minute. You get a phone call, someone wants you to go up to Scotland to speak to them about some secret project. And because you're always chasing the story, you normally go. And so I've worried quite a lot. Would it be possible to do both things? Could I be such a committed journalist and look after my son? I guess the truth is there aren't that many women in senior high profile roles in the UK. And I'm thinking, why is that? I've decided to make this podcast because I'm about to go back to work and I'm not sure how it's all going to pan out. I want to learn from other women who have already done it to see what they can teach me and get some advice. Today I'm interviewing Stella Creasy in the Telegraph's office. She's the MP for Walthamstow. Stella Creasy is a really high profile MP. She's campaigned on loads of interesting issues from abortion, women's rights, but actually You probably know about her because she's received a fair amount of flack for it. There's been all these protests in her constituency about abortion, really terrible pictures on walls saying that she's killed babies. It's pretty distasteful and also lots of it happened when she was pregnant. And Stella is one of those MPs who is a real campaigner. She really cares about her constituents and about the issues. So I guess I wondered how was she going to juggle being an MP and being a mother. Given the demands of the job, did you think to yourself um, before having the baby, okay, this is how I'm going to be able to juggle things? Did you have a plan or did you just cross your fingers? No, I mean, partly because, um, and I've talked about this previously, I struggled for a long time to have children. I was so, and I like a lot of people, I think, who struggled to have children, I was so convinced something would go wrong again. I didn't want to give myself the hope. I mean, the pain of losing multiple pregnancies was was so soul-destroying to me that I just couldn't, it was, a, it was almost a protection mechanism, which is a long roundabout so saying, no, I hadn't really done any thinking about, <laughs> apart from having a locum. Because yes. the one thing I knew was that, um, I wanted to be able to, to devote time to my baby if it was born and I didn't want Walthamstow to suffer as a result and as far as I was concerned there was a job to be done about representation and advocacy that wasn't just about voting in Parliament so we had we had somebody as a proxy to do the voting but we didn't have someone to do all the, the like you say, the meetings and the organisation and the supporting campaigns and, and advocacy, you know, the person who walks through the door whose child has just experienced something awful overseas does not need an MP who's absent. That's why I fought for a locum so that I could also know that in those first couple of months after having a baby, somebody else was looking after Walthamstow so I could get my head round. Childcare. It's terrifying, actually. Um, so... Typically for MPs, there's not previously there hasn't been such a thing as a locum. So how on earth have MPs managed when they've had children? <laughs> because that's the second half of your conversation is the challenge here, isn't it? I mean, when I um, so I uh, was about well, I was about fourteen weeks pregnant, contacting the parliamentary authorities, thinking, okay, I'm getting to the stage now where I might have to. So. Previous pregnancies I hadn't told people about and had lost them sort of at that critical juncture just before you go public. Um, With this one, I was right, Okay, I think this might go a bit further, so I'm going to need to tell my staff. And I I contacted parliamentary authorities and they still will, MPs don't take maternity leave. And I remember thinking, no, no, I'm sure they do. And then you realise that the default is a white man of a certain age with independent means who can afford their own nanny. I can't think who I'm thinking of. Um, And so anybody coming along saying, well, hang on, that doesn't fit, 
was a problem rather than a recognition that maybe there were barriers institutional that needed to be changed in order to make sure that we can have a democracy where people from all walks of life take part. So previously MPs would have had a proxy to cover the parliamentary process. Well, and they only had that because brilliant women like Harriet Harman and Tulip Sadiq. So Tulip Sadiq had to move her caesarean in order to be able to vote in the Brexit votes. Um, And that was for her second baby. For her first baby, she was back doing work three days after having had a C-section. You know, because the amount of casework that we get. And and I started talking to other MPs who'd had children, kind of going, well, what did you do? And, you know, I spoke to MPs who said, well, I hid in my constituency and hoped that people didn't notice. And you thought, "This this is crazy. You know, this isn't... This is the place that makes the law about how we support families to be able to have that work-life balance. And if they can't have that work-life balance, how on earth are we expected to make good law? One of my colleagues said, well, when they had tried to get help, the the IPSA, the parliamentary author who manage our finances and so would manage the budget to pay for somebody to be that cover, said, well, uh, this isn't a problem we often have to deal with, As as if we were causing a problem in asking them to have maternity cover. I don't think it had occurred to them, and certainly... We fought this battle to have a locum. Somebody actually said to me this was golden skirt feminism, that this was about special treatment for a small group of women. And I was like, actually, if we don't get it right in Parliament, then we'll never get it right in the public. So obviously I gave birth two weeks before the general election. Uh, So I have to say, when the vote was had to have the early election, I was standing at the division lobby, pointing at my tummy, (laughs) kind of going, seriously, people? Yeah, no thanks. (laughs) How do we make our parliamentary system more diverse? And one of the things is about making it fit with having a normal family life. The joke is that we have family-friendly hours because we have votes at seven o'clock in the evening. Well, you know, that isn't family-friendly. No. Um, But it's not just about the voting hours. It's not just about what happens in Westminster. It's about being, you know, not like my colleague, hiding in her house and hoping that her constituents didn't notice that she was missing an action because there wasn't somebody who could go and say... I'm covering for this person, Um, I'm their locum, I can connect you with ministers, I can raise issues for you, I can, I mean, my locum Kizzy, who was a phenomenal woman, didn't just do casework, you know, she went and spoke to school, she did the the front-facing stuff that MPs do, but that mattered to me, that nobody would feel they were being penalised for having a woman of childbearing age as their MP. So Siobhan Bailey tried to investigate having a locum, and Ipsa didn't go back to her, so, you know, it's still and how does that make you feel that they haven't changed the system? <sighs> Disappointed, but not surprised. I mean, that's the thing about women, you know, and, and equality, is that all the time it requires people to stick their head above the parapet, be called all sorts of names. So, you know, it's not just about having a baby. Now I've got a baby, you know, that doesn't make me any less competent or any less committed. It does mean I need to work in a slightly different way. Um, and yet it's almost like the struggle to have a locum it was like okay that was done but it was almost like after six months right now, now you've just got to go back to pretending you don't have a child and pretending that you aren't dealing with any of these things because somehow you're letting the sisterhood down or you're letting society down if you're saying okay can we keep talking about how we do this in a different way so maybe different times of meetings using online technology it shouldn't take a pandemic for people to start to have those conversations and did it make you feel at all vulnerable asking to work in a different way did you fear that either the parliamentary authorities or your colleagues would think oh you're not so committed you're rubbish or maybe your constituents might think the same so it's very difficult to untangle because I mean people treat um, I can't remember who it was the person who said that politics is, is show business for ugly people <laughs> um, people treat politicians as public I, I, I don't think of myself as a celebrity so there's a, an expectation that people can comment and critique I, I, I get commentaries about my love life I get which you know I mean I'll just about take from my mother but that's about it <laughs> you know um, you know you get people feeling that they have a right to say and and make judgments on you in any case i i think that's also the case with with being a mum um you know people, yes people come up to you in the supermarket yes, and say things yes um <laughs> and, and, and it's sort of doubly doubly difficult where you're thinking well is this because you're a constituent or just because you feel that you have a right to comment on you know what my daughter is wearing or her size or <laughs> and whether she might be hungry yes and <laughs> and you're biting down on your tongue yeah. very hard and sticking your nails into your hand to go uh-huh uh-huh thank you so much every time i get up in parliament of course there's that little voice that i think lots of women have that says well you'll probably mess this up <laughs> you know well 
you won't be as as coherent as your male colleagues or um you probably I don't know shouldn't have worn that dress or maybe and and, and I mean I get a lot of comments about people on my face because I have a squint so I'm always squinting uh, and people saying oh you're trying to look so earnest and you're thinking no it's because I'm trying to focus <laughs> <I can't see. laughs> um, I'm not going to pretend to you that it's water off a dog's back because I, I mean I don't know anybody who is like that yeah because absolutely you start thinking well maybe I should be uh maybe maybe I am less competent maybe I am actually uh, damaged in some way and then you think no I'm not I am still me and human beings have emotions have good days have bad days might be absolutely knackered because they've been up three times a night with a crying baby I had to take my baby into parliament for a vote because there was a point at which obviously they're not letting anybody else come in with you and there was an emergency debate on the Northern Ireland abortion legislation which of course is a thing that I had been working on um and my partner was at work, so I wheeled her through the park, got her to go sleep in the pram, parked the pram in the corner of the division lobby. Two minutes before the session started, I heard her cry, and I thought, I've got no option. So um, I took her into uh, into the chamber with as much food as I could stuff into <laughs> her, because she was eating solids, and asked my question. Unfortunately, I got reprimanded for it. But Did I would, you by whom? Uh, it was within parliament um by a parliamentary official I, n- no no it was uh, another mp who said it was inappropriate i think it, it goes back to my point about look we've all got a lot of us have got children and actually the more we normalize having them around the less of a big deal it will be for other people to have children but i didn't want to let the women of northern ireland down i hope they felt in the question i asked that i didn't and when it was the actual election what was the campaigning like when you were out on the street People in Walthamstow were lovely. Like, I was knocking on doors and people were like, if I vote for you, will you sit down and not move? Because I was kind of like, I was like Fagash Lil. I was like... <laughs> had you had a caesarean? I, d- I did have a caesarean in the end, yeah. Must have been very hard to um, walk around. And- well, no, I, so the election, I um, I gave birth on the 27th of November and the election was on the 12th of December. So it's quite pre- close. <laughs> I was I was very heavily pregnant, kind of. And there was a wonderful, I did a wonderful meeting with some... Um, the, the Afro-Caribbean society had a lot of retired midwives in and they all looked at me and went, that baby's dropped. And I was like, what, well, no, no. Like, they were Don't lovely. say it. I was like, maybe I should just sit here in case anything goes wrong. I remember actually seeing the picture of you with your baby in Parliament when you were sworn in after yeah. winning the election. I took my baby to the, to the count. I had to. I mean, yeah. what else was I going to do? And it's funny you mentioned that about seeing me in Parliament. What, what people don't realise is... In the middle of all of that, I got an email from the parliamentary authorities telling me that if I didn't come in to sign in as an MP and to accept being an MP, but my proxy signed in before me and voted, I would lose my seat. That's so a friendly email. You're kind of, you're in that post, you've just given birth, there's this new thing, all these different sensations, and you're thinking, what? <laughs> you know? So what was the plan? Was the plan to take a six months maternity leave? Yes. But then a pandemic happened. And so how did that work? Um, You came back to work, I think. Yeah, uh, very quickly. Um, But at the same time, obviously, uh, there was no childcare. Nobody could come and help me. So my family lived nearby me. They couldn't come and help me. Um, And my partner is a key worker. So he was away as well. So I was on my own with a new baby um, trying to work out what makes them sleep at any consistent time how you feed them, all those sorts of things. But also very conscious that um, in a crisis, it was all hands on deck. But how on earth did you cope with um, a very young baby? So thinking to m- about myself, when I had uh, my baby, I-, I could barely leave the flat, uh, get myself dressed, was pretty tough, get him dressed, get him to sleep and eat, all very difficult. Well, this is the downside, isn't it, about doing all these Zoom meetings, is, you know, camera on. Yeah, you don't you want the camera all. on. <laughs> Early on, she was pretty much like like very young babies. They they sleep, they eat a bit, cry a bit, go back to sleep. Yeah. Now she's very interactive. I mean, now actually it's much harder because she <laughs> she wants to play, she wants attention. She's crawling, she's almost walking, she's babbling away. Yeah. Um, I just I had my phone stolen last night, and I you know in all the kind of admin of it and it suddenly hit me like a sucker punch that I had so one of the things I've been doing with her and it sounds so soppy um, but I had been recording her laughing 
as her laughing and her kind of interaction with the world developed. That's nice. And what I've realised is that they're not backed up to the iCloud. So oh, I've lost no. all those little... And they're little tiny clips. And for nobody else would they mean anything. But for me, they mean the world. Of because course. Because it's just so magical, isn't it? The first time they laugh and you think, actually, they're laughing not as a kind of physical reaction, but because they've seen something. Yeah. So, you know, gutted about that just because as a child develops, you see before you such sudden changes yes. so yeah when the pandemic first hit because she was so small and so young it wasn't you know I put her in a large warm cosy uh, suit she fell asleep by me carry on working not a problem now and did you take her into Westminster or did you work yeah, at home yeah, I mean, prior to the um, the lockdown we there's a campaign I've been working on for a couple of years with a with 30 different organisations around making misogyny part of our hate crime legislation and we had a, a meeting on International Women's Day and I took her in with me and she just slept through the whole thing. Perfect. Yeah. And do you think the parliamentary system is kind of set up to support working parents like yourself? No, but the parliamentary system is is set up, I mean it's 650 sole traders working lots of different ways um, but it's not set up, I mean on a very basic thing, so we have this proxy system at the moment so I'm proxied because it's so difficult to get childcare I've, you know um, you know and, and there's a real crisis of child I mean and no one's talking about the childcare crisis really two thirds of women are struggling to go back to work I mean you know and I, I've raised that in parliament and the kind of chancellor just looked a bit blank because of course everybody they know has got a nanny mm. you know <laughs> A lot of people are talking about, you know, building back better and saying, OK, we've had this awful pandemic happen. Nothing can ever be the same. There is a real crisis, I think, where where women's voices and women's unemployment. I mean, we are about to face a massive tsunami of mum unemployment. And again, nobody's talking about it. But if you look at the figures, women were with, with children were 10 percent more likely than their male counterparts to be furloughed. Mm. And the people who are furloughed are much more likely to be in the line for redundancy. And the numbers of mums who are finding that their basic their jobs don't exist anymore it's actually about you know maybe when we do talk how we how we parcel up when work is done um you know i've said to my staff look you're, you're going to get emails from me later in the evening now don't respond to them it's just that's when i can be online yes to that's do your stuff. working time yeah so i've separate out the day now and then you know there's a chunk of time late afternoon where maybe they might have had stuff from me in the past they won't because that is dealing with my daughter time but i make up for it at a later point yeah um, helping change the British working culture so that it is more flexible but doesn't presume that people who work flexibly are less committed because I've I've had that repeatedly say that to me and also that I'm that you know now I have a baby I probably should withdraw from taking on positions of leadership and, and really? it would just be so ter- terribly difficult and you sort of think well it's not really it just needs to be done in a different way um, and who what kind of people have said that to you oh I, I you know various positions within the labor movement people i've i've gone for and then people said yeah but you've you've just had a baby so this isn't right for you and i sort of think we're living the labor movement which is supposed to be the movement championing equality and championing women's rights thinks that somehow having a baby um writes you out of public life what hope have we got for the rest of society um i had people telling me that i shouldn't stand for a position on the cooperative party nec because i just had a baby um i've had to fight to say that um, rather than it, the, the, the family-friendly focus isn't, don't worry, you don't need to turn up to an event. It's actually maybe we need to schedule it in a way that you can be part of. Yes, at a different time, for yeah. example. Um, and as I say, I feel very strongly that we should stop pretending that people don't have children yes. as the answer to what you do to make it work. I've been genuinely shocked at the presumption that I am now, you know, less competent, less capable, less interested. The people who pushed me to no longer stand for a, a leadership position, even though it was in an, a, a delegation for something that I had been uh, involved in for many years, I had a lot of experience in, because having a child meant it was all going to be so terribly difficult for me. That didn't feel to me a very progressive response. Um, as I say, being told that somehow I couldn't be on a, a representation committee within the co-op movement because I had a child, again, didn't seem to me the right cooperative response. And I didn't uh, I, I have been elected onto the co-op NEC and I I want to be a champion. You know, it's not rocket science why we still have majority men in positions of leadership, not just at the top of political movements, but across political movements. Because if we make it, you know, inequality doesn't always come manifest itself in open hostility. Mm. It's the unconscious bias. It's the well-meaning prejudice that says, 
oh, well, you probably didn't want to be involved in this. You probably didn't want to do that because you want to be with your child rather than saying, hey, how do we work in a way that makes this possible? And actually talking to other women within the labour movement and more generally, you know, within the media, people will admit it. But we don't necessarily talk about it. We don't get yeah. public and say, this is the culture. Um, I, I've had, as I say, other women almost act as if I'm damaging the sisterhood by wanting to openly challenge the idea that uh, you know MPs needed a locum and that we uh, needed to be able to say we had children. I shouldn't think that uh, anyone's ever said to a man, oh I'm not sure this job would be for you right now, your, your wife recently had a baby. No, well in fact and, and it's that classic thing where my male colleagues who've just had babies are lauded for being brilliant dads and isn't it great to see them with their kids and the, the, the brilliant um, Bridget uh, who the, the, the comedian has a fantastic routine about the grateful feminist and how you have to, you know, be gracious about men who want to pull their weight and you sort of think, we should just do it anyway. <laughs> yes, that should be the standard. Yeah. I don't want any of my male colleagues to be denied the opportunity to be with their families. I just also am very conscious that none of them are being asked or queried or, or questioned about their capability. If anything, people see them as more capable of being able to juggle and you sort of think something about that doesn't quite fit with mm. the reality for all sides on this and you said that um, some people were hostile to you when you were uh, pushing for a locum or more mm. rights what kind of things did they say was that men as well as women no it was women and I think it is you know everyone must choose I mean a locum wouldn't necessarily be for every uh, member of parliament they might choose to do things differently um, but there were a number of women I mean a, a a government MP accused me of making out to be a victim, women to be victims for wanting to have maternity cover. And I thought, I'm really not. I just want to make sure the casework gets done. I mean, can you imagine coming back to your inbox after six months if, if there wasn't somebody doing it? It shouldn't be that women manage and struggle through. Why do we, why do we make it ourselves to be martyrs? I don't want to be a martyr. I want to be a good mum and I want to be a good MP. The two shouldn't be in, intercha- you know, the two should be interchangeable rather than a conflict. And the reality is those questions aren't being asked in government. Um, and I think it's because we see equalities as something as about the ladies rather than about our economy. So there's a cold hard economic logic for me as somebody who's committed to social justice as a corporation and a socialist, which is the more we remove the barriers to people being able to achieve what they're capable of, the more I'll benefit from their potential. So what do you think needs to happen to improve <laughs> um, women's return to work after maternity leave? Oh, well, first and foremost, we've got to save our nursery and childcare sector in this country. And uh, I'm extremely worried about what might happen by the end of this year. You know, it's quite telling that at the start of the pandemic, the only piece of business reporting and business um, legislation that the government changed was to drop gender pay gap reporting. It's not really about gender pay gap reporting. It's about the message it sends in our economy about who really has the opportunity to make things move. Um I think you've sent your daughter to nursery for a couple of days a week. How have you found that? <laughs> well, she loves it, which I suppose I ought to be offended by, but is lovely to see. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a relief, isn't it, if they're yeah, happy? Yeah, I mean, I think like any parent who had a child during lockdown, you worry about socialisation because normally, so just before lockdown happened, I just started taking her to various classes and things and kind of hanging out with other mums and, and dads and that all had to stop. Um, so you... I understandably I think was worried that she might find um, socialising with other children or other people disconcerting nope taking to it like a duck to water oh that's great <laughs> have you felt guilty or the kind of emotional separation no oh, I miss her laughing yeah of course I do um, like any parent but um, uh, I mean I think people want you to feel guilty because that's part of the in- the incompetence thing mm. but I I refuse to give up on the idea that we can't try and make things work to get close to having all we want. Mm. I see the rage, actually, of mums who are having to struggle and juggle. Yeah. Um, because actually the work from home, as we know, in the whole, it's been women who've done the childcare whilst they've been working from home. And it's 2020. Mm. You know, uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants from the, the feminist movement who fought all sorts of battles, and yet it feels like we're going backwards. I think the, the bigger question for me is this concept of juggle and struggle that we sort of presume must be involved. And it feels to me like we're already answering a question that we didn't ask, which was, um, can, can this be different? And we're answering it with, well, probably not, rather than possibly yes. 
Um, I don't know whether we can change not just parliament but public life, the presumptions about women in the workplace within my lifetime. I'm going to give it a go to try. Do you know, I was really surprised with what Stella said about the hard time she'd been given by fellow MPs when she'd asked for a locum to cover her work when she was on maternity leave. Surely if Parliament can't get it right, if our political parties can't get it right, what hope is there for the rest of us? She was quite firm on the idea that the system needs to change. It's not women who need to change once they've had a baby. Certainly Stella's way of thinking has been quite thought-provoking for me in that way. And maybe we should smash the system. Next week, I'll be interviewing Emma Pinchbeck, the Chief Executive of Energy UK, on how she found going back to work after having her daughter. Subscribe to this feed to make sure you don't miss it. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please do consider supporting our journalism by taking out a Telegraph subscription. You can get your first 30 days for free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio.